It's my pleasure this morning, as you can note in your agenda here, we have someone who is very familiar to our work. In fact, one of the producers and one of the people who've had played an instrumental role in both Check and Connect and the Student Engagement Instrument. Um, Dr. Uh, Amy Reshley is a professor of educational psychology and coordinator of the school psychology program at the University of Georgia. Her scholarly work focuses on student engagement, dropout prevention, and working with families to promote student success. She was co-editor of the Handbook on Research on Student Engagement with Sandy Christensen and a co-author of the Student Engagement Instrument and its extensions. She has also worked as a Check and Connect mentor from 1998 to 2000 and is an alumni of the University of Minnesota. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Reshley. Okay, good morning. Um, I'm so pleased to be here today, and actually I was really enjoying just talking to you over breakfast, but I think I'm here to talk up here, so I'll do that too. Um, it is a real honor to be back here at the U and at this conference on Check and Connect. Um, coming here always feels a little bit like coming home, although I think I have adjusted to the weather in, in Georgia, and so I've been cold and my fingers are cold. Um, my, my texts have been a little um, funny since I've gotten here. But I've really enjoyed meeting so many of you and speaking with you at the sessions. Um, I began my graduate program here as a Check and Connect mentor, working with elementary and middle school students in one of the local counties. The primary focus of my work since arriving here in the fall of 1998, and I keep checking that math every time I say it, and every time it comes out to 19 years, and I can't, I just can't figure that out exactly. Um, the focus of my work since 1998 have been on the areas of dropout prevention and more broadly the importance of student engagement for all students in our schools. I want to start my talk today with some of the lessons we've learned in dropout prevention and conclude with talking about the need for school-wide engagement efforts. So. Um, what is our goal? So the first and one of the most important things I learned here and from my mentor, Dr. Sandy Christensen, is that the goal of our efforts is not to prevent dropout, but to promote successful school completion. We want students to have skills, attitudes, and behaviors they need to be successful, productive members of our society. We could design an intervention that is focused on seat time or have police officers forcefully deliver children to school each day, but getting kids in school without learning and without the skills they need to be successful high school completers is a waste of our time and resources, and it doesn't help kids. Hence, our focus in Check and Connect and on schooling in general is not just preventing a bad outcome, but we want to promote a good one. We want to promote competence, school success, and school completion. Which leads me to my first lesson, the first and most important lessons. There are no easy or quick fixes. So this reminds me of a story I tell my undergraduate te teacher ed students. Oh, I'm going to have to, sorry. Of my undergraduate teacher ed education students um, when I talk to them about evidence-based interventions. So if you um, let me digress for a moment, I want to tell you a story about my Auntie Ruth. So um, when I was a teenager, my Auntie Ruth was in her 80s. And she was sweet, to me anyway, had led a very interesting life and did not have much of a filter. So I have some really, really good stories about her that I enjoy telling all the time. So at one point, I was visiting Auntie Ruth in Des Moines, and she had a jar of raisins soaking in liquid in her refrigerator. And I thought to myself, that's a little odd. Like, maybe Auntie's starting to lose this a little bit. But, but I asked her, I was like, you know, Auntie Ruth, what's up with the jar in the fridge? And she's like, oh, um, my friends and I are um, using raisins soaked in gin to treat our arthritis. And she's like, we start the day with some, and I think they really help, right? It was great. And so um, that was a pretty low stake solution for my auntie and her friends. Obviously, it's not an evidence-based intervention, and nor was it a cure <laughs> for her arthritis, but she had a pretty good time. Right? So when it comes to dropout or other complex social problems, there aren't quick or easy fixes like the raisins and gin in the fridge. For example, you may remember hearing about the so-called Texas or Houston miracle from several years ago, where a school district essentially cured their dropout rate by recoding their dropouts as other things. They, they coded them as um, school transfers, GED recipients. They said students had returned to their native country. And then the reported district event rate during that time was 1.5%. So 1.5% of their students had dropped out in the year. When you go back and look at the data, it was actually somewhere between 25 and 50% of students. It was just too good to be true, right? 
In a similar vein, sometimes legislators will come up with the idea that they can raise the compulsory school attendance age as a way to cure dropout. Or the compulsory school attendance age refers to the age at which you can legally drop out of school within a state. And across the country, there are a variety of um, laws related to that. In some states, you just need parent permission. Some states, you can be 16, 17, some say 18. Um, the idea is, if we just make it harder for kids to leave, they won't. Well, having worked in Check and Connect and having been studying dropout prevention for years, I knew that that wouldn't work. And the reason is, <laughs> those proposals don't focus on the reasons why kids want to leave school or provide any support for helping them ensure they have those skills and attitudes necessary to be successful for completing school and for life. So we, um, a graduate student and I, Rebecca Landis, uh, took uh, all the national data sets we could find on dropout and we analyzed them by states that had changed rates, um, states what rates were within states and states that had no um, laws about compulsory school attendance age. And what we find is that changing the age or whatever the age is within your state does not have effect on the rate of dropout or the timing of dropout within each state. And again, that's because it doesn't focus on the reasons why kids want to leave school, nor, nor does it um, reflect what we understand to be the process of student engagement and disengagement over time. So we know that dropout is best understood as a long-term process of withdrawal, of di disengagement that is preceded by less severe forms of withdrawal and disengagement in middle school, elementary school, and even early elementary school. Which leads me to my next point, one that is nicely summarized by Danyarski and Gleason. Dropping out seems to be as hard to prevent as it is easy to do. There is a disconnect between what we understand between theory and promising interventions with both public policy and practice. For example, dropout prevention efforts typically begin at the high school level when the event of dropping out occurs. Support is initiated after kids' academic and behavioral problems and disengagement are severe and therefore much more difficult to address. It's not like there was one day or one quarter when a student was in the 10th grade and they were like, you know, I love school. I've been here every day for the last 11 years. Love everyone here, did well. I'm just not coming back tomorrow. And that's not how it works. It's not this sudden event like that. Or, as I discussed with compulsory school attendance laws, initiatives and decisions are made without reference to theory, understanding of the research of predictors of dropout, or understanding promising school completion efforts. With respect to pathways and models of dropout, studies have found that family and early childhood experiences are predictive of later dropout, as are elementary school attitudes, behaviors, reading skills, and um, attachment to school and peer relationships. And a number of very accurate middle school predictors have also been found, with things like failing grades in English and math, attendance, and behavioral incidents. My point is this. Many of our interventions are not well designed, they're not grounded in theory, and they come at a time when it is too little, too late. Which leads me to one of my next points. I'm sure you've heard at this conference, or it's the reason that you came to the conference. Check and Connect is one of the few promising and empirically supported intervention programs to prevent dropout and promote school completion. One of the best and most compelling sources of evidence for this fact are the reviews by the IES What Works Clearinghouse. The What Works Clearinghouse evaluated dropout prevention programs outcomes in three ways, completing school, progressing in school, and staying in school. Only 13 of 30 programs demonstrated a potentially positive effect in any of those three areas. Only one program of the 30 was rated as having a positive effect in an area. And that, of course, was Check and Connect. You've probably heard in other presentations at this conference or um, in your own reading on Check and Connect. The program was thoughtfully developed, drawing from systems theory, the literature on resiliency, motivation, Coleman's concept of social capital, cognitive behavioral interventions, and it is also grounded in the dropout literature. Like Check and Connect, other interventions in the What Works Clearinghouse that are promising or having potentially positive effects are comprehensive, individualized, and long-term. There are a variety of causes and reasons for dropout, and thus there isn't one particular strategy or program that will work for every student who's at risk of dropping out. Nor can an intervention that is lacking in intensity or is limited to one strategy, such as an add-on counseling or tutoring program, have a sufficient impact given the severity of disengagement for those who are at highest risk. Looking at the What Works Clearinghouse list, it is clear that promising programs include several strategies. Academic support, mentoring, credit recovery, career development, small learning communities, or smaller, more personalized settings, and this combination of efforts is, extent, is sustained for an extended period of time. Our own intervention work with Check and Connect suggests that the later we start, or the more disengaged students are when we begin, the longer it takes for us to have a positive effect. 
So in addition to being comprehensive, individualized, and long-term, effective programs also address students' engagement at school and with learning. Well, what is student engagement? Interestingly, we all know what engagement and disengagement look like, right? Um, engaged students pay attention in class, they participate, they complete their homework, they're involved in activities at school like clubs or music or sports, they care about school. Disengaged students are typically described as disinterested, unmotivated, and uninvolved. Do you recall in one of the earlier or first Harry Potter stories, Harry finds this something called the mirror of her said in the room of requirement? Remember that? So the mirror reported re reflects the deepest desires of those who look into it. So every person who looks in the mirror seems something different. Studying engagement can feel that way sometimes. There are many scholars and many different conceptualizations out there. A few years ago, we edited an international handbook on student engagement, and we asked scholars from all over the world to provide their definition. Based on this work, we offered the following summary. Student engagement refers to students' active participation in academic or co-curricular or school-related activities and commitment to educational goals and learning. Engaged students find learning meaningful, are invested in learning in their future. It is a multidimensional construct that consists of behavioral, including academic, cognitive, and affective subtypes. Student engagement drives learning, requires energy and effort, and is affected by multiple contextual influences and can be achieved for all learners. Engagement seems to be that rare construct that practitioners and scholars share an interest in. I mean, honestly, how often have you read a news story or heard something on the radio and thought, they studied what? Or wait, that, why, right? Engagement doesn't seem to be that way. It's not the case here. So Fredericks and colleagues describe student engagement as a meta construct, or meaning that engagement is this umbrella or super category that brings together previously separate lines of research into one concept or construct. So previously we studied things like belonging, connectedness, motivation, participation in class, extracurricular activities, attendance, self-regulation, the value of education to one's future, separately, whereas engagement allows us to bring all of those interests together for a more richer and more accurate depiction of what student school experiences are actually like. There is also general agreement that engagement is multidimensional, involving aspects of students' emotions, cognitions, and behavior. Engagement is also amenable to intervention. I was a little bit unsure if this chart would work, even on a screen as big as that one, so I, I'm going to try to do my best to explain what's here. I think because I'm here at Minnesota, it's reminding me of a time I saw Standino present at, of course, somewhere that was very warm where he could also golf, where his figure of a student's growth chart didn't load, and so I watched him um, make his, the trend line, right, with the goal line with one hand and then his elbow to make the trend line with the other to show that the student's reading intervention had worked. So it might be a little bit like that, but I'm thinking about this. So. Within the field of dropout, we have long been aware there are different classes of variables that are predictive of dropout and school completion. Distinctions have been made between those variables that are push variables within a school environment, things like disciplinary policies, out-of-school suspensions, grade retention, and those that are pull variables, or things outside of school that pull students away, like caring for a family member or needing to get a job to help support your family. We've also looked at whether a variable is proximal or distal relative to the event of dropping out, and those that are status or demographic, and those that are alterable, or what we think of as amenable to intervention. We recognize we cannot change status variables. I can't, I can't change whether a parent or sibling dropped out of school. I can't ask parents to remarry. I mean, can you imagine what that would be like? I can't move children from states with low completion rates, like South Carolina, to states with higher completion rates, like Minnesota, Iowa, or Nebraska. Or I can't change student socioeconomic status. Those variables that are amenable to intervention are engagement variables, attendance, homework completion, class participation, and extracurricular participation, and so forth. And these engagement variables are directly tied to student success within an academic year and to long-term outcomes, such as high school graduation, college attendance and persistence, and employment outcomes. One of the most useful distinctions here, I think, is Sandy Christensen's distinction between demographic and functional risk. If we look at national dropout rates, we see that variation exists based on status or demographic variables like socioeconomic status and race ethnicity. 
Demographic risk may be useful to guide identification procedures, but it is functional risk, as represented by student school performance and students' engagement, that determines risk even within demographically high-risk groups. So who needs intervention and who doesn't? So if we say, for example, that 40% of students within a racial ethnic group don't complete high school, that means that 60% do. So if we only use the demographic variable or the race ethnicity variable to identify who is at risk, we would have wasted resources on 60% of kids who would have been completers anyway. So again, we use functional risk, student engagement variables to guide and identify who is in need of intervention and who isn't. Now, the origins of student engagement are in the dropout literature. Engagement is the basis for a most widely accepted theory of the developmental process of dropping out, and intervention scholars have been writing about engagement for preventing dropout for at least two or three decades, with things like, saying things like, engagement is the bottom line in school completion efforts, or from a developmental perspective, academic engagement is the key to dropout on the personal side of the equation. Furthermore, Promising Programs and Check and Connect are programs that seek to enhance students' engagement at school and with learning. What's changed is that interest and engagement has expanded. It isn't just about dropout anymore. Interest and engagement crosses disciplines like public health and school reform. It has also become of interest to scholars around the world, and that is, there, that is because there's evidence to suggest that engagement is relevant for all students from elementary school through college completion. And as we concluded in our handbook on student engagement, it is re related to a variety of short and long-term outcomes across academic, social, emotional, and behavioral domains. Engagement drives learning and predicts school success for all students. Finally, humans, all of us, everyone in this room, all of your children, all the students you work with, we have fundamental needs for autonomy, belonging, and competence. We often think of our intervention work as seeking to engender these feelings of I can, I want to, and I belong. Engagement then, maybe you can think of it as a manifestation of the extent to which those fundamental human needs are being met. Now, those needs for autonomy, belonging, and competence became apparent to us when we worked with students in Check and Connect. We discovered that re-engaging students required more than helping them meet academic goals or behavioral standards. In order to do those things, we had to pay attention to relationships, belonging, motivation, and future goals, the fundamental needs for autonomy, belonging, and competence that underlie successful school engagement efforts. So once we understood the importance of the other ABCs, autonomy, belonging, and competence, and students' affective and cognitive engagement, we had to think about how we could measure and track students in those areas. We easily have access to data on kids' academic performance and behavior, and those things are important. It is not an either or. Remember, engagement gives us this richer, more accurate description of student school experiences. The question is, how could we get at what we think of as more internal or difficult to observe types of engagement? You can't look at a student and tell if they feel like they belong at school, or whether they think education is relevant to their future. And if you ask them, you might be surprised at what they say. So we created this four-part typology of student engagement based on our work with Check and Connect. You may recall that I said engagement is multidimensional, involving some aspects of emotion, cognition, and behavior. And yet I have four types of engagement listed here. Intervention informed the way we, def we define student engagement in Check and Connect. We differentiated academic engagement from behavioral engagement because we wanted to be able to provide a better link to intervention. We saw students who were behaviorally engaged but had not yet academically engaged with the school environment. So if we go to this figure, academic and behavioral engagement are easy to observe and measure. In fact, schools are already collecting these data without calling them engagement measures per se. Academic engagement is students' active participation in learning. Students who are academically engaged are spending time on task, completing assignments, earning good grades, and earning credits toward graduation. Behavioral engagement encompasses school-related conduct and participation in school-related activities. So students who are following school rules, attending school, participating in extracurricular activities, and engaging in positive behavior. Cognitive and affective engagement are more difficult to observe. Cognitive engagement is students' investment in their learning, valuing of learning, perceiving learning as relevant to their futures, and using cognitive strategies to help regulate their learning. Students who are cognitively engaged set goals for themselves, put forth effort in their work, and can see the importance of schoolwork. So this is really the I can and I want to part of engagement. Affective engagement is a student's sense of belonging in school and identification as a learner and with the school. 
Students who are affectively engaged feel good about being at school. They are connected to their peers and adults. They see themselves as learners and feel like they belong there. This is the I belong part of engagement. Cognitive and affective engagement are critical because it seems they precede changes to academic and behavioral engagement. This means that being cognitively and affectively engaged in school leads to having good grades, following school rules, attending, and doing well in school. Therefore, many of the interventions Check and Connect mentors implement focus on cognitive and affective engagement, trying to help students get to being able to say, I can, I want to, and I belong here. So I want to take a moment to review my major points so far. School completion, not dropout prevention, is our goal. There are no quick or easy fixes. School completion efforts must be comprehensive, individualized, and long-term, and grounded in student engagement. Engagement is tied to important short and long-term outcomes of interest and is relevant for all students from elementary school through college. Engaging students for school completion requires more than attention to academics and behavior. We have to prioritize relationships, belonging, motivation, and future goals, and the fundamental needs for autonomy, belonging, and competence that underlie all successful school engagement efforts. Okay. Now, if we think something is this important and we can't observe it, we have to find a way to measure it. So furthermore, we believe that students are the most accurate reporters of information about themselves. Following that principle, that leaves interviews and surveys. Now, interviews can give us a ton of good information about kids. I love to sit and talk with kids about their lives. I'm always surprised at how articulate and perceptive they are about teachers, kids at school, what's cool, how peer groups work, and things like that. But these could be time consuming and don't necessarily translate easily to our predictive or progress monitoring work, which really suggests the need for some kind of self-report survey. This led us to develop the Student Engagement Instrument, or SEI. The SEI development was a collaborative effort with Jim Appleton, Sandy Christensen, and myself. We've also worked with a number of colleagues like Joe Betts and Dan Heisen, and several doctoral students on SEI projects, such as Matthew Lovelace, Chandra Carter, Kate Frazier, Chris Pinzone, Anna Goodbread, and Devin Waldrop, on various studies and iterations of the Student Engagement Instrument. The SEI is based on the model of engagement that grew out of Check and Connect and is intended to measure cognitive and affective engagement. The pilot study of the SEI was conducted with a large, diverse group of ninth graders. An initial set of items were developed, refined in focus groups with students, and then 56 items were piloted on the first survey. Exploratory and confirmatory factor analyses identified 35 items that loaded well on six factors, three representing cognitive engagement and three representing affective engagement. The cognitive engagement factors are future goals and aspirations, control and relevance of schoolwork, and extrinsic motivation. Sample items for each of these in order are learning is fun because I get better at something, school is important for achieving my future goals, and I'll learn but only if a teacher gives me a reward. The affective engagement factors are family support for learning, peer support for learning, teacher-student relationships. Sample items from each of these factors include at my school, teachers care about students. Other students here care about me. When something good happens at school, my family or guardians want to know about it. So I want to talk a little bit about the evidence for the SEI. We've had several studies that provide support for that original factor structure, six factors, three each for cognitive and affective engagement. There's also evidence of measurement and variance and equal score reliability across grades six through 12. I had to ask a couple times what that means. Measurement and variance is actually a good thing. Um, it essentially indicates that SEI scores function similarly for different groups of students. That's good. And so students of different grades and different gender. Now, we find low to moderate significant correlations between in expected directions between those SEI scores and other measures of school performance, such as achievement, attendance, and disciplinary incidents. Another study uses, using a sample of 35,000 middle school students which that number blows my mind when I think about it. 35,000 students examined and compared SEI scores for three different groups. So the first group were those who were behaviorally disengaged. Think about it as determined by absences and disciplinary incidents, so high behavioral disengagement, and a group that was, had low behavioral disengagement. Um, the next group was those with emotional and behavior disorders, and we compared that, which is a group that is at high risk for dropping out, we compared that group to a student, uh, a, group of students with speech and language impairment because they have much lower rates of dropping out. 
The third group of students were those who had um, above average achievement and below average achievement. When you compare SEI scores for each of those groups, you find they, they are significant and in the expected direction. So meaning that students who are behaviorally disengaged also have much lower scores on their cognitive and affective engagement. Students with emotional and behavior disorders on average have lower scores in their cognitive and affective engagement than those with speech and language impairment. And those with higher achievement have higher scores in their cognitive and affective engagement than those with lower levels of achievement. Another study examined the relationship between the SEI and another measure of engagement and motivation, Andrew Martin's Motivation Engagement Scale. This provides evidence of convergent and divergent validity for both instruments. And probably the most impressive results so far involve the long-term predictive validity evidence for the student engagement instrument. A study by Pearson found that 69% of what they termed college-ready graduation could be predicted from eighth grade variables. SEI scores accounted for a large portion of that prediction. Another study found that after controlling for demographic variables associated with dropping out, ninth grade SEI scores predicted dropout and on-time graduation from high school. A follow-up study to that provided another level of um, a more stringent criteria in their evidence, looked at whether SEI added any predictive value above and beyond what schools are collecting and perhaps using in their early warning systems. It does, and two factors in particular, the Future Goals and Aspirations Scale and the Family Support for Learning Scale, contributed unique variation in the prediction of dropout and graduation. And finally, a recent study found that after controlling for demographic, behavior, and achievement variables, SEI scores in the 10th, 11th, and 12th grades predicted college attendance and persistence through the first year. So we have extended the SEI both upward and downward. Um, there's a version, a version we have developed for use with college-age students, which we call the SEI-C for college. Um, and you may recall I talked about the importance of engagement in elementary school. Therefore, we have created a version of the instrument that can be used in grades three through five, which we call the SEI-E. And we recently piloted a version that, for possible use in grades one and two, which we have termed the SEI-E1 and SEI-E2. It would seem that we're making progress on being able to measure student engagement across the span of schooling, from early elementary school into college. As a researcher, this is really exciting because understanding typical development helps us better understand student risk and inform our intervention efforts. Our research with the SEI, for example, indicates that student engagement declines from fall to spring within each academic year. Which, of course, makes sense. If you think about what, for all of you, perhaps as well, when we return to school in the fall and students return to school in the fall, we have new classrooms, new, you know, we get to see our friends again. We're a year older, new school supplies. It's, we're, we're excited to be back, usually. Um, by spring, we have survived high stakes assessments and we are coasting on fumes until the end of the school year. And that's the true of all the adults I know and the students in schools. Our research also suggests that engagement declines each subsequent year on average. So seventh graders are a little less engaged than sixth graders. Tenth graders are a little less engaged than ninth graders and so forth. Now, because our focus is on intervention, uh, we have piloted a version of the SEI that could possibly be used for progress monitoring. You can see that um, we followed some rules in naming of our instruments. We call this the SEIB or the SEI brief. So I want to make one other thing clear, is there are other measures of student engagement. I'm able to talk most about, most comprehensively and well about the SEI because I know the most about it, um, but there are some other um, measures out there. So Jennifer Fredericks completed this review um, for the IES, and um, it includes all engagement measures from those with a single four-item scale um, to full measures like the student engagement instrument. So I've included that information here so you may follow up on that as well. Another thing I learned here at the University of Minnesota and as a school psychologist is this principle. To benefit kids, the purpose of assessment must link to or inform intervention. Check and connect is of course an intervention and a pretty great one at that. But the purpose of measuring student engagement is also to inform intervention. So for the last decade, we have been working on delineating promising practices and evidence-based interventions for each type of engagement, academic, behavioral, cognitive, and affective. In this work, we classify each as primarily one type, with some caveats. More, most, the most promising intensive interventions, like Check and Connect, have several components that because they are comprehensive. 
Further, even an intervention that what we think of as primarily a cognitive intervention, for example, probably impacts other areas of engagement. So for example, an intervention to address self-regulation of learning would also affect students' affective or behavioral engagement, or we would hope so anyway. Similarly, an intervention that is primar primarily about relationships and belonging probably also has collateral effects on students' effort and participation in school. So recall that the appeal of the student engagement construct is that it allows for a more complete depiction of student school experiences, and thus those have many dimensions that are related. So what became abundantly clear in the 19 years, I, it's still 19, um, since I first started as a Check and Connect mentor is this lesson number four, a school-wide focus on student engagement is needed. We discovered early on as Check and Connect mentors there were times school policies and practices got in the way of our efforts to re-engage students. This is a theme that has emerged in other scholars' work as well. There is a tendency to prefer intensive services are delivered as an add-on, like tutoring or an add-on counseling program, without addressing other things in the school context. Because student engagement is a meta-construct, we can think of it as an orga organizing or unifying heuristic with a range of academic, behavioral, and social-emotional interventions for students. So I had to move offices recently. And if any of you remember, you know how often we do that as faculty, right? Like, not often. So unless it's to a bigger office with more windows, or frankly, even when it is, um, we act like it is a huge imposition. I've heard another professor, Tom Fagan, joke that he's going to die in his office so he doesn't have to clean it. So um, it's been six months since my big move down the hall on the same floor, and I'm still not quite done putting things away. But this last week, I came across this picture on the left. Um, it's a drawing from my son. So apparently, he came to class with me several years ago. And I was discussing something along these same lines. Now, he is 15 and 5'11. And I'm guessing he was about five here. But it was never much into drawing, per se. If you need some help interpreting it, um, that is me with a pointer pointing to a pyramid. That is him hugging me, which is sweet, right? And then those are people apparently listening to my lecture. At least, we presume they are. But I didn't ask them, so you know who knows. Um, but I'm, so let me get myself organized here. What occurs to me in this picture, other than it's really cute and sweet, and I need to pull that out periodically when I'm dealing with the teenager to remind myself that, of that, um, is there's a remarkable consistency in this message over several years. Intensive intervention services, like those provided in Check and Connect or for more serious academic and behavioral difficulties, are best provided within an overall system that is geared toward effective programming for all students, with successive levels of intensity of intervention provided according to student response to evidence-based interventions. We need a range of services that vary in intensity, a systematic data collection for important engagement variables, and coordination across levels of schooling elementary to middle and middle to high, as well as across contexts and adults in each building. The argument that student engagement is now a basis of high school reform also pushes us to think more comprehensively or broadly about student engagement. So at this universal level, we are thinking about things like, what is it that we do for all students to engender those feelings of I can, I want to, and I belong? Things like freshman academy, a district advisement program, small learning communities, looping students and teachers across years, changes to curriculum, social emotional learning programs, and so forth. We may address student engagement at this whole school and district level and then target students who are showing signs of disengagement and withdrawal for further and more intensive services. Now, in order to highlight intervention targets, I want to talk briefly about our model. Well, actually, it's not brief. I'm going to talk about our model on student engagement that grew out of our work with Check and Connect. I also want to give credit to Angie Pohl, who made this figure um, pretty and coherent. My drawing is probably something like my son's on that earlier slide. So if we recall that engagement is alterable, that's why we care about it, and it's influenced by context. The influence of context on student outcomes, it's through its effect on student engagement. Or in other words, context influences engagement, which in turn is directly related to student outcomes. The important context for student engagement and in turn school performance are the family, and we look at things like learning resources, academic and motivational support at home, and families' goals and expectations for their students. Peers, things like educational expectations in the peer group, peer group attendance, peer aspirations for the future, academic and beliefs and efforts. At the school level, we look to things like relational climate, quality of instruction and curriculum, 
mental health and academic support, and management. School management includes disciplinary climate, authority, and opportunities for participation for students. And at the community level, what we really want to know is can students be involved outside of the school and outside of their homes in the broader world and in their communities? Um, good options for this are service learning opportunities. The thing about context is that they can either thwart or enhance students' engagement. And this is one of the reasons we look to context when we start thinking about our intervention efforts. I want to skip to the other side of the model and talk about outcomes. Um, sometimes people ask whether engagement is a process or an outcome. And the answer is yes, it's both. So completing school or dropping out of school is a developmental process of engaging or disengaging and withdrawal, respectively, from the school environment across several years. You might recall there being cycle, you might think about it as there being cycles of engagement over time, like ripples when you throw a rock in the water or a spiral. Um, Engagement has a rich get richer quality. So as students are engaged, they get feedback from the environment that promotes greater engagement, which then creates a cycle of engagement and increased social support. And there are both short and long-term outcomes of interest. Short-term outcome of interest, short-term outcomes of interest include things like GPA, performance on high stakes assessments, responsible decision making, or conflict resolution skills. They may be outcomes at one time point, but then are also processes related to later outcomes of interest, like high school graduation, post-secondary education, and employment. Um, now I want to go to what the, is at the heart of this figure, student engagement. I want you to notice there are circular arrows linking the types together. We know these types of engagement are related. So for example, when you read summaries of the research on something like PBIS, or positive behavior intervention and support, we see that not only are there improvements in school's disciplinary, di disciplinary behavior, but school climate, bullying behavior, peer victimization, and academic achievement. Or when classrooms are managed better, there is more time to devote instruction, to, more time to devote to instruction, which typically leads to improved achievement for students. And if I were to guess, better managed classrooms also have a better relational climate. So these things are all related. My parents are devoted behaviorists, and I know how ridiculous that sounds. I'm guessing you have never heard those words uttered in that combination before, but it's true. So you know that five to six week period when you have a baby, but before it smiles at you for the first time? They would tell me that, that was, I was on a thin schedule of reinforcement, and having teenagers is not that different. Or my brother and I are certain that our father has a legally binding contract that says if we don't mow his lawn by Saturday, he's going to take away our cars. So I teach undergraduate and graduate courses in behavior management, and I teach behavioral consultation and problem solving. And yet, since I began working in schools, first as a paraprofessional in Ames, Iowa, and then later as a mentor in Check and Connect, is the relationships that have most interested me. We know that relationships play a huge role in dropping out and dropout prevention efforts. When you ask students why they dropped out of school, they say things like, my peers dropped out, I didn't like school, I was expelled, or I had problems getting along with teachers. There is also a misperception that students leave because of an early transition to adulthood, pregnancy, or needing help to support a family. Now that is true for some, but when asked, dropouts are much more likely to give a school than a family or job-related reason for dropping out. Also, it isn't necessarily true that students leave because they can't do the work. It is true of some students, but 88% of dropouts have passing grades. Instead, those students talked about a, the quality of the teaching and the curriculum, lack of interest in school, and how students were treated by peers and teachers. This brings me to the topic of gifted dropouts. One of my doctoral students, Rebecca Landis, had to convince me that this was a thing, which became the focus of her dissertation studies a few years ago. I'd spent most of my professional time or life concerned with students who had emotional and behavior disorders and learning disabilities. A graduate school friend of mine in special ed used to joke that gifted students would learn about gravity when the broom fell on their heads, meaning that gifted kids would get what they need out of school without us having to really do anything special for them. Boy, was I wrong about that. Gifted students do drop out of school, and for the same reason other students do. A lack of interest and relevance to their future, difficulties getting along with teachers and peers, and feeling like they don't belong there. Um, the first study I ever conceptualized and carried out examined the closeness and quality of relationships between mentors and students in Check and Connect. We asked both students, even as young as kindergarten, and mentors in the program about their perceptions. We found that student perceptions and mentor perceptions of closeness and quality were related to success of the intervention. Again, interventions matter for all, relationships matter for all kids. 
So the importance of relationships isn't just at risk, isn't just for those kids who are at risk of dropping out. Some of my favorite quotes on this are Ann Maston's quote about the best documented asset of resilient children is a strong bond to a competent and caring adult, which need not be a parent. It is also thought that relationships provide children with resources to foster positive development, regardless of their risk status. Sometimes I'll ask pre-service teachers, I teach a large undergraduate intro to ed psych class for anybody who wants to be a teacher or a school professional in the state of Georgia, and it's really fun. But sometimes I'll ask them about their own teachers, and I've never had a student who couldn't name every single teacher they had from kindergarten through high school. They can't usually in college, but all of those teachers they can name. And goodness, do they remember if a teacher didn't like them or if they felt like they were treated unfairly. The quality of those relationships always matters. There's some indication that perhaps early relationships in the school environment might be of particular importance. Um, some of Bob Pianta and his colleagues' work look, have examined the quality of relationships, both in terms of positive and negative aspects. So positive aspects like closeness and negative aspects like conflict. Those relationships in kindergarten predict student outcomes through middle school. You may think of it as placing students on a trajectory at school. Another study by this same group of scholars um, looked at what factors helped close the achievement gap between students in math. They found two things were significant. One is higher level instruction, so not just drill and practice basic stuff, but exposure to higher level skills and concepts and teacher-student relationships. All interventions, all learning, are delivered within the context of a relationship. Teacher-student relationships predict engagement at every grade. There is some suggestion they are most important for those who are at risk, but research also suggests, there's two meta-analyses on this topic, research also suggests that high school students, um, relationships are very important for them for maintaining their engagement at school as well. Other evidence comes from public health. There's a famous study by Michael Resnick, um, a national study, finds that students who feel connected to families and schools engage in much less risky behavior. And essentially, a number of studies suggest that when students perceive teachers care about them, they put forth more effort. So effort, in turn, is related to, is an indication of cognitive engagement, is related to students' academic and behavioral engagement and outcomes in school. The importance of cognitive and affective engagement is also reflected in recommendations um, for school reform and dropout prevention. An IES panel convened on this topic recommended smaller, more personalized settings for students. Others reiterate the need for intensive interventions, academic and personal support. And of course, Check and Connect is a relationship-based intervention. We track back academic and behavioral indicators of engagement, but interventions are personalized and delivered within the mentor-student relationship. So if we go back to this model, we have placed affective and cognitive engagement in the middle, or in a place that temporally suggests they, have, they come first. We have to address cognitive and affective engagement to have an impact on other types of student engagement and outcomes. Now, I mentioned earlier we have been working to delineate promising practices and effective programs for each subtype of engagement, affective, cognitive, behavioral, and academic. Because of the need for and importance of school-wide efforts, we have divided these types and programs into universal and targeted strategies for each and then have described a number of promising programs at each level as well such as the Good Behavior Game for behavioral engagement, HOPS for academic engagement, the Self-Regulation Empowerment Program for cognitive engagement, and Banking Time for active, affective engagement. Now, one of my professors here at the U once told us that the mind can only take as much as the rear can stand, and I suspect there is a schedule they would very much like me to adhere to. So I'm gonna conclude discussing some general recommendations and leave you with references for some of those chapters and a forthcoming book we have on the topic of engagement subtypes and interventions. So engagement, as I said, is a unifying heuristic for understanding student school experiences and connecting context to important outcomes. Intensive and targeted services must be provided within an overall system that is geared toward effective programming for all students. Targeted and intensive services are not new or categorically different from what we want to provide for all students. Rather, these practices vary in intensity, not in kind. I want to briefly talk about early childhood programming. There are several longitudinal studies of high quality intensive programs that suggest preschool can have a long-term positive effect on outcomes, including high school graduation. Within the context of engagement theory, it would seem that is because students are better prepared for school with attitudes, skills, and behaviors they need to be successful when they enter school, or they're ready, and therefore they have a better chance of establishing the engagement cycle of participation, success, and identification with school. 
Other things that we examine are the quality of curriculum and instruction, which of course are directly related to students' academic, behavioral, and cognitive engagement. As they say, one of the best forms of classroom management is good instruction. Creating a climate of caring and support, all of us need to feel like we belong and people care about us. Looking for and supporting opportunities for student participation. Extracurricular activities are associated with all kinds of social, emotional, and behavioral outcomes. We also want to examine school disciplinary policies. Fairness, consistency, policies such as out-of-school suspension that undermine our goal of successful school completion. And we want to implement timely academic and behavioral interventions. We can prevent many more severe problems with screening and early intervention. It's much harder to be successful if we wait until problems become severe. We want to focus on regular school attendance for all students and staff. Hedy gave an excellent talk on this topic yesterday, and we know from our work on Check and Connect that we have to get students in school before we can address things like their relationships with teachers and peers, academic interventions, problem-solving skills, and so forth. And students, all students, judging from national data sets late recently, all students need social and emotional support and access to services as needed. In terms of some of our implementation recommendations, um, we want you to systematically monitor the student population on key variables and follow up with students who are at risk. This includes things like attendance, behavioral difficulties, homework completion, rates of participation, student self-reported cognitive and affective engagement, and so forth. We want to also integrate these forms of engagement data with other data that you're already collecting, in particular in your early warning systems, course failures, and test scores. We also want you to maintain and use data on student perceptions. In this case, we collect, analyze, and report data on students' perceptions. What students have to say about school is pretty important. We want to look at what typical changes are within an academic year and across grade levels, identify atypical patterns, and identify those in need of support. And we want to use that information to inform and evaluate school-wide interventions. So we can find out if things like our district advisement program, or looping students, or social-emotional learning curriculum are effective. We also want to increase support during transitional periods. So we want, to make part of our, we want to make this part of our systematic monitoring, or RTI and MTSS plans. We want to use information to plan for additional support for all students, small groups who are at increased risk during and following a transition, and individual students. And finally, I want there to be coordinated efforts across levels of schooling. I'm sort of, I find myself, when I was thinking about how I wanted to end this talk, I'm tired of the way that we kick the can from elementary school to middle school. When you're in middle school, they'll say, well, the elementary school didn't do their job. And when you get to high school, they'll say, oh, it's the middle school, they didn't do their job. I'm tired of that. I think we have to be coordinating across levels and adults and buildings. If we know students who are at risk in first grade, second grade, third grade, and we know who they are in sixth grade, and we know who they are in eighth grade, there's no reason that we should be waiting until 10th or 11th grade to begin our efforts in re-engaging them with school. So I promised I would leave you with a few references, and so I'm going to do that. Um, I want to finish by saying I had a, I've had a great time at this conference. It was an honor to be um, presenting here, and I look forward to talking with so many of you um, during the rest of the day. So thank you. <laughs>